So we're going to talk about some hard things today, developmental education. We're going to talk about structural things because the kinds of problems we need to address are system problems. They're not problems of individual faculty members alone. But in all the data that we have, K. McClenney's beautiful data sets, longitudinal studies, Arlene Onsbarger sets, my interviews with more than 700 community college students. The single most common comment of students who succeeded is a comment about a faculty member they name as making an individual difference in their life. So systemic reform and politically driven reform, legislative actions that cause us to change what we're doing, all that stuff is driven by a powerful set of theories of change. But at the classroom level, unless faculty actually play the role of putting in students' minds the ideas of what kind of lives they can have, especially like really poor kids like me who just had no conception of what I could actually do with my life, that keeps coming up in the ethnographic stories and the qualitative studies of student success. So this should never, ever be forgotten. And I'll just tell the story. So I worked at LACC as a groundsman. I went into the horticulture program. I was 24, I think, when I went back to school. I had dropped out. It was the 60s, right? <laughs> I dropped out for six years. And um, I walked into the, it cost $6 to go to community college a semester in LA then. And I, I think it, it was like I didn't have lunch that week, right? And I walked into advising and they said, what do you want to be? And I said, oh, I don't know, I want a job. Right? And they said, well, what do you like to do? I said, I sort of like to hike. And they said, okay, outside, you're in the horticulture program. <laughs> that was the level of sophisticated data analysis and psychometric profiling, right? What do you like to do outside, horticulture? And I ended up working for, grant, mounds, uh, for grounds and maintenance in the LA Community College system for five years. And I loved math. I was really good at it in high school. But I didn't see, I didn't have a vision that you could connect it to a job. Right? I just was good at it, I liked it, I even was part of the math club, I was the captain of the math club at one year. But I just put it completely aside. So on my lunch breaks at LA Los Angeles Community College, I would sit outside the temporary building where the chairman of the math department taught his algebra courses, which is still there as a temporary building, by the way. And it's LA, so he'd open the wind. The windows were open, and I would sit outside and I would take notes and listen into the math because I needed to do something more intellectually interesting. And he saw me out there, and he invited me into his classroom. I don't know why you were triggering this nostalgia. <laughs> he invited me into his classroom, and he said to all the other students that you can eat your lunch during this class because he knew that if unless people could eat lunch, I couldn't be there because I would have no other time to eat lunch. And he graded my homeworks and he gave me his own books from the University of Washington. I did really well and then he took me to his cousin at what was then Valley State, which is now like the Interplanetary University of Northridge, this name inflation, <laughs> right? Institutional name inflation. And then from there, he made sure I got to UCLA. When he retired, I, you know, a whole bunch of us went you know, to honor him. And I asked him if he had any idea the profound impact he had on my life. And of course, it was like 20 of us, not just me, right? And he said to us, he says, well, look, one of the great things about teaching is even on a crappy day, and you have a lot of crappy days, you can do something wonderful, right, for an individual student. That's one of the special privileges of the job. And then he said, this is the time when the movie Chinatown had come out with Faye Dunaway, sister, daughter, you know. And he said, well, sometimes I feel like the character that I feel really proud that I was able to do what I wanted to do as a faculty member in my life. And in the other times, I feel just rage that your success should depend on having me as, as an accident of what I did for you in a particular class. 
And why shouldn't the system actually do this for all students? Really profound, good guy. So when we talk about the structural things and the data and what's known systemically about the courses we offer, it's hard. There's hard work in front of us. But at least we have the privilege of on a crappy day, <laughs> right? Just taking a breath, picking a student, and putting in, like he did for me, actually inserting directly into my head the idea of what kind of life I could actually have. Because if you grow up poor, as I did, or if you're an outsider or an immigrant, the world looks to you like this monolithic, homogeneous mass of otherness. And when I taught at Swarthmore College or UCLA, for those students, the world is made up of all these intersecting little social worlds that they feel as privileged that they can enter. Right? They're extremely good at crossing boundaries. And because they're privileged, they can be a member of anything. All they have to do is figure out the rules, and they know that they can figure them out and succeed in them. And that was completely different for me and I, the guys I was working with in auto mechanics and horticulture. We always felt like we were visitors to the worlds where we were working. And teachers, in my case, really shifted my attention and helped me understand that I was a legitimate citizen of all of these worlds if I wanted to be. So we have much more power, right, to act. We're in a privileged position. And we should use it, right, for the good, even on a crappy day. So look, everyone, everywhere, I have been on 60 college campuses and community college campuses in the last four years, usually teaching for a day. Because unless you actually teach on a campus, it's very hard to figure out what the campus is like. Right. Campus, some campuses, the, I told the presidents last night that all presidents use exactly the same vocabulary to describe their campuses. If you just listen to the presidents, like every community college would be identical. But when you're actually teaching in classes, what you see is some places feel like an Indian River and Valencia, which are large places. You feel like you're in a community center. The students are hanging out. They know the faculty. There's all these sources of informal information about what you're supposed to be doing. And then there are other places where it's like you're in some godforsaken place in Kansas in a gas station of Route 66 or something like that. Students you know, come in, they get filled up, and then they disappear. And the propinquity, as they say in social psychology, the human connection, psychological and physical, is like zero very functional, I need a job, I need courses, right? But no socializing or acculturating mechanisms on the place. And those campuses have much worse success rates than the places that have high relation. When you look at the campuses that really feel like community centers, faculty respect each other, they have figured out how to work with each other. The presidents have figured out how to create a buffer to keep the craziness away from the campus. Right? It's clear what everyone is working on. And this stuff really deeply matters. So DevEd. Well, this is an enterprise shaped more by the weight of history than by the actual needs of students or the jobs that they're going into. So you probably know the data. The data is like Old Testament bad, rivers of blood, frogs, locusts. California two years ago, 35,000 students took a developmental course, almost all math, for the fifth or greater number of times. In Alabama, in Tacoma Community College, last fall there were no spaces in any Dev Ed course because all the spaces were filled from people who had pre-enrolled and failed it the year before. Uh, the CCRC, Tom Bailey data, shows that if students get referred to DevEd, the probability is much greater that they will end up with debt than with any form of certificate. So this is really, really bad. And it turns out we've inherited this 50-year-old system, 60-year-old system, 
created in the mid-1950s when we started diversifying campuses, the old community colleges before the 70s reconstruction of them. And it was a time when community colleges were mostly connected to high school school districts. They often had common boards. It's way before your time, the generation before yours. Community colleges were just splitting off from K-12 systems in most states. And the people who created Dev Ed were largely high school teachers. And there were two things that there were, you can read the minutes, the onion skin minutes of this stuff. <laughs> The two things that they were interested in when they constructed these, the mean length of a developmental sequence in the U.S. is 3.4 courses, according to Tom Bailey. What were they thinking? They're not going to escape learning how to factor quadratics and rationalize binomial absurd denominator. These were high school teachers on a mission. There was not one single word in any of the founding documents about working backward from what students actually need in college courses or programs of study. This was about high school math circa 1951. Right? Second, the theory of why students had trouble was they were all immature. Remember, they were not thinking of our students who probably averaged in the mid-20s. They were thinking of their high school 17-year-olds who had failed to earn any credits in math. And their main theory of action was that those students needed to mature so it would be good to make long sequences of courses, spread them out so students could mature. Our returning students worry about over-ripening and rotting. Right? So we've sort of inherited this historical structure and we take it as if Moses himself on tablets came down and said, this is what students actually need. College algebra and stuff of that sort, which basically has zero, the most common use of algebra by American adults is helping their children with their algebra homework. <laughs> I'm not kidding. About 11% of jobs in the last ONET study actually have anything related to algebra in, in, the, in the job itself. Although people need these courses for upward mobility, they're used as proxies for quality. There's lots of other math that actually would be really useful, even in technical programs. So we've inherited this beast, and we need to change it. Right. Now, there needs to be a really high bar for change when you're messing with established structures. Because unless there's stability in our systems, you can't really incrementally improve. And you get into this thing where you have the traditionalists or the administrators who look backward for solutions. They're very careful. Has anything like this happened before? And then you have the reformers who believe the future will always be better. Right? It's really a temperamental thing more than an evidentiary thing. See, administrators know that things can get a hell of a lot worse <laughs> if you're actually running an institution. Right? But reformers are necessary because they will into existence futures. So we have to be really careful. Otherwise, we get flooded with innovation. And we don't have the capacity to deal with many things at the same time. But by any standard, the bar for rethinking remediation is really, really clearly met any way you do it. The failure rates are massive. Amy knows this story that uh, San Diego, one of the Southern California community colleges, borrowing from Kay McClenney's work, I asked on my visit to interview all the students who started in level one learning support, basically arithmetic, who went through the whole calculus sequence. Because I think it's really important to look at successes, not just failures. So I go to the meeting, I had agreed to you know, order pizza and have a focus group, right? And the head of IR sheepishly came in. Well, she's here. Her name is Rosemary Martinez. <laughs> Rosemary is a wonderful woman in her 40s. She's an engineering tech person now. Wonderful character. One student made it from arithmetic through the calculus sequence in three years in that institution. Took her about five years, working full time. So we have this gigantic enterprise that's supposedly preparing people for what in 1950 was the only math that, if you were taking math in the 1950s, you were thinking engineering. Right now, 
with statistics and STEM fields, mid-level technical fields, there's enormous other things you actually need. But our system was designed 50 years ago. Right? So we just have, I have interviewed so many people who want to be policemen, firemen, EMTs, who've taken everything except that bloody college algebra course, and they're taking it four times. This is like criminal. This tears at my mathematician's heart. But people who are stuck on their campus think they're defending the integrity of the mathematics and losing perspective of how broad mathematics is today and how unnaturally powerful it is. We're teaching students the least powerful aspects of the subject. Creative ways to factor trinomials. What to do about that pesky radical three in the denominator of that fraction. I, And then, like, my former math chairman believed that every student, including the art students, needed to take calculus. So he, had, he just, you know, he just believed it. And he wouldn't accept anything but calculus for art majors, PE majors, you know, nurses. And finally, I got, had enough, and we had this little, you know, I would say screaming match in his office. And I said, like, factoring, why do students really need, not, Engineers, yeah, 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 but why is it that students really need factoring? He says, well, when you do residue calculations and complex variables, it's clear that you have to know factoring. All right, I concede for those nine students. <laughs> factoring is key. So we need to embark on modernization. And I want to talk about how people are doing it not how we're doing it in Texas, we'll talk about a little bit, but it's not our idea that you should necessarily adopt Texas. See, Texas is wonderful. If we do anything right, everyone is positive that they could do it better. <laughs> Massachusetts, they go, yeah, well, it's Massachusetts, right? And they all expect New England to do these things really well. But I'm going to give you a, a landscape view of it. And when you look at reform of remediation, which there are no places where people aren't working on this. They're working on it in ways that are not likely to lead to success. So think Albert Einstein. When you work on a hard problem, Albert Einstein said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And make sure you're working on the right problem. So when you look at the data, our friends at the Gates Foundation and Lumina thought this was about DevEd. It was yet another case where people at a great distance gave us wrong, bad direction. It's actually the gateway courses that are the right anchor. If you look at the gateway courses, which is usually college algebra, and you look at students who place into it by a compass or acuplacer, so they meet the cutoff score, 59% of African Americans who meet the acuplacer score fail, get W, I mean, by fail, I mean WDFRI, right? Basically fail, fail to complete it with a C or better. 40% of whites fail it, 37% of Asians, 53% of Hispanics. So we have a lot of people trying to repair DevEd and build a six lane highway into a swamp. The best efforts need to start with the core college level gateway courses and work backwards and rethink what do students need to succeed in those. And they need to look forward. How does the content of the gateway courses relate to the programs of study that students are seeking to pursue? In Texas, but we're not alone, right? Our approach is, it was really tempting to start on DevEd because it's taught by adjuncts and it's sort of the marginal cash cow program. But the real place to start is what's happening in your gateway courses. And what's the evidence base for the content of those courses? And when you do that, you realize that you have very little control over that because of articulation and applicability rules with neighboring institutions. So the real work has to take place at the state level or regional level. Because you need to, you can't do this by working out separate agreements with every individual campus. 
There needs to be a process in which all the relevant stakeholders are in the room, including the people, not only for the people from the job world, but people from regular academic majors. And it needs to be based on what you actually need. Right? It doesn't mean there isn't room for the beauty of mathematics and so on, but more of it than is currently there should be focused on the real needs of the workplace and academic majors. Right? And this has to happen. So when you look at the content, 1950s, pre-calculus, college algebra. So there's a CBMS, Conference Board of Mathematical Sciences, survey every five years. So we get fairly good data on what's happened. We know 6% of community college enrollment is calculus or above. That's all. So we have these massive enterprises aimed at 6% of the population who's going to take these courses. Most of you have one section, two sections of calculus. Right? You don't have 20 sections of calculus. Most jobs, we have real labor data now. 50 years ago, the way they got the importance of math was they asked CEOs. CEOs don't typically have a clue what happens on the work floors in their companies. And the way you know this is one guy at the University of Pennsylvania studied the reflections of CEOs about what math their people needed, and he divided the CEOs for, to those born in the U.S. versus those born in Europe. And the European CEOs basically thought that their workers needed the typical European high school curriculum, and the American CEOs thought they needed the typical American high school curriculum. So basically, when they were asked, they were reflecting on what math they had to prepare, not on the actual needs of the jobs. Then when ONED at the Bureau of Labor Statistics was created, they shifted to ask HR directors, <coughs> because they do the, fill out the job application stuff. And it turned out they had a better idea, but it's still a poor idea. And then four or five years ago, the Bureau of Labor started sending out guys like Mike Handel at Tufts University on the workplace floor, show me the math you used in the last hour. Completely different picture emerged. Right? And it turns out about 11% of people use high school math. Statistics, the importance of statistics, variability is growing like wildfire. Many more people need that now. It wasn't even around 50 years ago on the radar screen. And a lot of people really need to know middle school math really well, flexibly, and how to use it in unfamiliar situations. Like they need to really understand proportionality. They need to understand precision if they're in technical programs. They really get, need to understand how decimals work, how place value works. They need to understand error and variance, not just mean, median, and mode. So it's time for us to modernize these programs. So content is box one. The second, so on some campuses, people are working on content. On other campuses, people are working on structure. So the data is clear <coughs> that most students, um, the sequence structure is too long. If you're in four different Dev Ed courses, two thirds of all the students who take Dev Ed pass the course but they drop out between courses. As some of the students in case studies say, by the time I finish Dev Ed, I'll be ready to retire. So what are they doing? They're accumulating debt and not college credit. All based on a 1950s theory, they needed time to mature. Well, there are some students, adult basic education, where we actually don't know how long it will take to consolidate basic ideas. That's an open question. But research shows, Tom Bailey's research shows, for example, a large number of students who are misplaced by Occupacer would be better off if they were directly in a course with highly organized and intensive support as a co-requisite rather than taking a prerequisite. Or a one semester preparation course directly organized and linked to the college credit course three courses and they're gone before they ever get to the college credit. So we are experimenting with this. Our work with the Carnegie Foundation, 30 campuses, we're seeing promising data, like really promising, big effects. 
but we haven't done randomized controlled trials. We don't know exactly how much of it is selection artifact. It's too early. But all the indicators are pointing in the right direction. So sequence structure is really important, but some, most places that work on it think it's the total, the magic bullet, not magic buckshot, right? They're working just in that box. And then we have the people who are working on delivery. A MOOC, magical thinking, Hail Mary pass, right? Using modern technology to deliver bad content cheaply. <laughs> Most of your campuses have a pretty diverse population. Their lives are complicated. We need to organize instruction to fit the actual lives and constraints of our students. Right? And that's going to require two or three different vehicles for doing it. We know that military folks are really good at hybrid online instruction. Some face-to-face, -face because in the military, that's how you learn. Right? We know that returning women who had really good high school backgrounds but are rusty and a little terrified actually do really well in self-paced automated classes once they get confidence. But 17 and 18 year olds with no self-regulation skills, disaster, complete disaster. So we need to figure out with our IR people, how do we get the right student in the right pathway at the right time? Right? And that needs to be an institutional research key project. But the delivery can solve the problem of bad structure. Right? And we just can't allow it. Uh, before I say something about student supports, I want to say something about data. On the campuses that are really effective, like Valencia, Indian River, Santa Barbara, uh, campuses that have won the Aspen Prize for community colleges, when you're on those campuses, I've been on all of them, when you go to them and you ask the faculty data, they can tell you the data, not only about what's not working, but they all know the data about what is working. So in most campuses, when the data people get involved, it's because of a crisis, so they can tell you what's not working. But you can't actually build stuff off what's not working. If you want to build stuff, you have to build it on what is working and what, what your real strengths of your institutions. That means you have to actually know what's working and who you're helping. And on most campuses, it's all anecdotes. This is like the plural of anecdote, we're data. Right. So when you actually figure out what's going on on your campuses, before you start reviewing, you had better figure out what's working first because you don't want to screw that up. Systemic change tends to kill off the best and the worst. So you've got to protect the best. But you've got to be objective about it. It can't just be the student you helped. Right? You have to know systemically what is really working in your institutions and what are the anchors for building a better structure. And then you have to have a beer and confront the stuff that isn't working. And you have to do it with as little emotion as you possibly can. Be analytic about it because it's people's lives. I told the presidents last night, we did a focus group in North Carolina. And we had faculty, we had the governance board, the presidents. And then we had a student panel, and the first student gets up and he says, he's facing faculty and behind them are the presidents, and he was sort of a randomly chosen guy, Piedmont Community College, and he said, like I'm 45 years old, my name is this, I have a wife, I have three children, I lost my job, I need a job, I need to support my family. I've cashed in my 401k to do this. Can you guys promise me that this is going to work for me if I work hard? I'm starting to have to start in arithmetic. I was laid off at a mill. And it was just like traumatic. And one of the faculty members said, you know, I go to church with this guy. Right? These are my neighbors. This is not like some 17-year-old directionless kid. Right? This, this is my community. And the faculty were like clinically depressed because they really didn't know whether they could promise him that hard work was actually going to produce a job. So this is really, really serious stuff for people. 
right? And we professionally can't be wed to our little idiosyncratic affections about completing the square or rationalizing fractions in particular ways. As we say, Bob Moses, a wonderful character, who I chaired his advisory board for many years, civil rights guy, he said, if you can't actually see the faces of your students in data, your data isn't going to help you all that much. It's a really wonderful observation. So student supports. <clears throat> student supports need to be rethought at a profound level. So we go first week, the theory of students, when you go to campuses in the first week and you go to the tutoring center, no one's there. You have a lot of tutors waiting for the students to be in trouble. If you're in any of our math classes and you're a week behind, you're dead. You're not going to catch up if you're a week behind in a math class. It just doesn't, just, you know, maybe one student will. You just don't catch up. So this is theory is these are adults. They'll discover their needs. They'll use the campus resources. Orientation, they'll learn about them. And then they'll know as soon as they're in trouble to get help right away. Yeah, right. Well, we haven't found any examples of that on planet Earth, maybe on some of the outer planets that actually occurs. And when you step back, when you interview the student learning center people, if they are clinically depressed, because the most common thing they say, if I only got to that student earlier. So it's worth going back in history. How did this come up? Well, student, Harvard had a tutorial center in 1680 or something. There are always like special things for students in trouble. But it wasn't a professionalized industry, and faculty ran it until the 1950s. Until the 1950s, community college and four-year faculty were responsible for freshman advising, and they had advisees. The thing that ended that was the GI Bill. When the GI Bill came, any American was supportive of the GI Bill, but not as faculty members. As faculty, we thought it would endanger the academic quality of our institutions. Then civil rights came. We were all for civil rights, but we worried that our institutions, when we diversify the population, quality would go down. It was extremely political when the first vets and the first black and Latino students came to campus. And because it was political, the administration took responsibility for them. They hired people to tutor them, and they built learning centers that were always in the basement of the administration building in the beginning, or basement of the library. And when they created a learning center, none of the faculty said, hey, wait a minute, if they're the learning center, what the hell are we? Right? It was understood that it was a particular political problem that needed to be solved. Now I trust your campuses look exactly like your communities. Right? You actually look like you're in America. That wasn't true in 1955. You look like you were in Vermont, even if you were in Texas. Right? So we've democratized access to higher education. And we still have these student support structures run by professionals over there trying to help students succeed in courses run by faculty over here. It's time to step back and rethink these structures on our campuses. More of the responsibility for students has to fall to faculty, and faculty need to coordinate the people trying to help students succeed in their classes. And what are we seeing now on campuses? The first two weeks on some campuses, all student service personnel are in classrooms with the faculty and their students. So it destigmatizes support. The students meet all the staff that, who are here to help them in their classrooms on the first day of instruction, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day of instruction. Right? Coordinated case management plans. So the students working, the tutors report back to the faculty on the progress of students. This needs to be systemically rethought. It will not be easy. There are turf, well-established turfs that are there. But it has to happen. The other thing that's stunning is we actually know now why students have trouble. 
The historical thing was to make a list of things that students needed in student support and turn it into a 15-week course, learning frameworks course. So it was like a box of things, you, buy, you bake and shake it, turn it into a course, put it in the oven, comes out of course, and then students take the course to learn how to be successful in college. Skip Downing, Paul Nolting, good people. All the stuff makes sense as individual items. None of it is actually coterminous with the issues that students face. So what do we know about students? In community college, more than 90% of students, this is reliable data from multi-sources, are positive they're going to succeed in their first semester. Almost all of them want to get degrees beyond what they get in community colleges, even though they have no clue what those degrees mean. They have generalized high expectations for success, low levels of concept differentiation about what they're actually going to do. What happens, this is Kay McClenney and Arlene Onsbarger, first day of class, the students are gobsmacked the pace. They've never experienced the pace of a college class. It's not the content so much, that's a separate problem, the pace. The first homework assignment, they like want to do it. The tapes are hysterical, like I'm not one of the screw-offs, I made it to college. We got ourselves together, I'm going to get a better job, I'm going to invest in myself. They're looking at the math homework, I have no idea how to do this. I have no idea what's really being asked for me. How many hours am I supposed to be working on this? What do I do when I'm stuck? And what happens, this is called picoeconomic modeling. What happens is their confidence drops a little. And as soon as their confidence drops, they start hedging their bets. They'll add a discretionary hour to work, they'll go to a party. Human beings hedge their bets when their confidence drops that they'll succeed. The main driver of motivation is belief you'll succeed. So they drop, then they put in a little less time, they have a second crisis, and it goes through this recursive cycle of disengagement. And David Yeager, who's going to give a talk around here upcoming, and is a brilliant psychologist, just a stunning superstar, has modeled all of this with data from 30 campuses. So they go into a cycle, and by the fifth week, their confidence is way down, and depending on who they are culturally, either they disappeared or they're in class without their prefrontal cortex. And you've all seen this. Student services do not address these problems. The second big issue is calibration. Now just sort of close your eyes and envision your students getting their first quiz back in math. I got a C, like it's a lottery. Maybe if they put the hand in and took it back a different test, they would have gotten an A. They're completely unable, they're completely clueless about what grade they're actually going to get. If you're clueless about the relationship between your effort and your achievement, that's incredibly demotivating. Right? If you can't predict the outcome of your effort, that's highly demotivating. So calibration is a major, major factor. And then the third big factor is identity. We know from David Yeager, and he's going to publish it this summer, 30 campus data, thousands of students, the single biggest predictor of student withdrawal, overwhelmingly in careful factor analyses, is when students start questioning whether they made a good choice to take a particular class. As soon as they start doubting the wisdom of taking a math class or of coming to college, dramatically accelerates the likelihood of withdrawal. So these are the actual structural problems. And by the way, for the people working on this, uh, the basic math courses, there's very strong evidence that if students think this is about compliance or jumping through hoops, they memorize the stuff in short-term memory and forget it right after. But nursing students and others who think they're learning the math because it'll affect patient safety and because they're going to use it in their job actually encode in the, not in the visual cortex, but in the prefrontal lobes on fMRI scanning. You can see that how people position themselves in identity 
shapes the way they organize the content and memory, which affects their ability to retrieve information later. So this business of uh, recursive cycles of disengagement, calibration, identity formation, and belonging are powerful research-based constructs. None of these are connected to the regular student support classes. So we need to modernize student support. And we're working on this. Um, it's a new science, so we have to see. You know, we're going to get better and better at this. And we've seen uh, dozens of student support classes now. And the first thing you see is that they're typically an accident of what the person who created them happened to care about. So on one of our favorite campuses, which I'll leave nameless, half their student success course is about emotional intelligence. And when you meet the guy who put it together, you understand why emotional intelligence was so key <laughs> when he discovered that in his own life. But we, can't ha we need a scientific approach to this because this is really important for people's lives. And the fifth is faculty support. The community college industry invests less in its workers than any other industry on this planet or in this solar system. If we're actually going to rebuild courses, it can't just be like for fun or hobby. It can't just be like the three people who love to be involved in redesign, right? And the other people can choose not to participate. We can't let dysfunctional notions of faculty autonomy run the day. We need first to be clear about our professional collective responsibilities for improvement. And that's going to require investment, structures. It can't just happen because someone decides, I want to work on this, and it's OK if he doesn't over there. This is, this is a critical moment in the redesign of our work. <clears throat> so let me just end this part with what this work's really about. The American, so we, we're wonderful people. America is a great place, but we do have character faults. One of our character faults is that we, pr we, pr we prefer nostalgia to actual history as a country. So we like to believe that dem democracy is going to be here because the Founding Fathers got it right. We will build a country on ideas and not on blood. Beautiful ideas. Democratic ideals are so strong, they'll preserve us through any crisis. Bullshit. Democracies are extremely fragile. The Weimar Republic, anyone with a sense of history knows how easy it is for democracies to become destabilized. The first thing in recessions is people pull in their sphere of responsibility. Then they start hating immigrants, right? They worry about their ability to survive and thrive. Democracies are pretty fragile beasts. The American democracy is built on a social contract that says through hard work and education, <clears throat> your life or your child's life can be better than yours. No longer true in the US. We have the second lowest rate of intergenerational, the elasticity of intergenerational income after the UK, and we're very close to the UK. A person in the bottom quartile of income now has less of a chance of rising to the middle than someone in France or Germany. That is scary. So what are the vehicles for upward mobility in this society? The first one used to be government jobs. That's how you became middle class for many people. You worked for the post office. You became a teacher. Thank you. <clears throat> government jobs are the fastest declining portion of the workforce. <clears throat> second was the military. Thank God the military is decreasing in size. And very few poor people pass the test to get into the military now. It's no longer a vehicle. In fact, <clears throat> scary data. So I chair the Department of Defense Studies and Mobility in Military Families. And two years, three years ago, we met with the Joint Chiefs. I taught a graduate class where we did a project for the Joint Chiefs. And we asked them, what are the scariest things? What are you worried about most? The first, of course, if you know the military, was suicides. 
That was the first thing on the mind. They could all name all the people in their branch who had committed suicide. The second was, for the first time in American history, half the people in each branch of the service came from families who had been in that branch. Rapidly decreasing portion of the population actually serving in the military. And they were afraid that they'd have an insular, insular military without broad public commitment to it, which is terrifying. Uh, so military, uh, government jobs, small businesses. Small businesses have been killed in the recession. They're not adding jobs very quickly. The fourth vehicle is community colleges. That's our mission. That's why community colleges were created, to be a vehicle for upward social and economic mobility. Yes, we have the mission du jour, but the core DNA spine of community colleges, upward social and economic mobility in communities. That is what we really need to be focused on. So the next time you have a math department fight about whether we should teach completing the square or factoring in the unit on quadratic equations, and it gets intense, take a breath, go out and have a good beer, and remember what the enterprise is actually about and role you play in your community. This is like really important for people's lives. And it's really important for our country. We've inherited a system that was shaped by, more by the weight of history than by the needs of our students. And the completion agenda, the political pressures to increase degree completion and certification are going to adversely affect quality and access. And if we allow them to affect access and quality, as faculty, we have betrayed our professions. Our job is to protect and, re and redesign the integrity of the disciplines, right? the integrity of the content. That doesn't mean we have to stay with the same content that was needed 50 years ago. But our job is to protect the integrity of content we put in place. If we don't do that, it's a betrayal of our mission. And this is going to be hard. Because once you start putting in the processes that are associated with success, mandatory orientation, most students don't do optional, right? We're seeing mandatory orientation, no late start classes, intrusive advising, reintegration of student support with faculty work. In every case, that causes a decline in enrollment. And in current funding formulas, that threatens the financial viability of institutions. So this work has to take place at the president's level in tweaking the new formulas for funding, <clears throat> and at the faculty level in making sure there are courses worth taking. So at the Dana Center, we call this a joyful conspiracy. Most improvement efforts start at the governing board level or in the legislature or in the faculty or by the presidents, and none of those have a chance of working because you need to have coordinated action across all levels of the system. It's what my colleague Jenna Cullinane calls cycles of mutual permission giving. So when you think about your role in the New England economy, all the people in this room in your roles have a key role to play, but those roles have to be coordinated because we're messing around with core structures of our institutions. And let me just end by saying, there are going to be some bad days now with funding Connecticut. You can see what's happening. So at least we have the privilege of just blanking it out, picking a student, and just doing something wonderful for that student. And may that get you through the days, right, to building a better system together. Thank you.